I welcome you to the top 10 channel, subscribe to the channel, put a like, and we start the next top. Ten serial killer cops. Most people associate police officers with the phrase to protect and serve, but what happens when the honor and trust that underpins that emotion is betrayed? You'll learn about ten notorious serial murders, all of whom were police officers, in the sections below. They all exploited their power and authority to commit horrific crimes, and some even investigated their own crime scenes. Tor Hedin. Tor Hedin, a Swedish serial killer, arsonist, and police officer, began his criminal career by stealing oats. He broke into a nearby brewery when he was 16 to steal some grains. Hedin then decided to set fire to the entire building in order to hide his tracks. Eight years later, in 1951, a rally was organized in Hedin's honor to ensure that he remained the city's local police officer. Following the rally, he executed his first murder assassinating his best buddy, John Allen Nielsen, at a poker game. The crime scene was subsequently set on fire by him. Hadeen, in an ironic twist, took part in the investigation into the murder he committed, even speaking to national media about it. Hadeen went on a killing rampage after his girlfriend, Ola Ostberg, broke up with him around a year after he killed Nielsen. His first stop was in Saxtorp, at his parents' house. He assassinated them both and then set fire to the house. After that, he went to Ostberg's retirement home and climbed into her room through a window. When he couldn't locate her in her room, he went downstairs and discovered Ostberg in the matron's chamber. With an axe, he killed them both, barricaded the doors, and set fire to the building. Four elderly individuals perished at home, while a fifth died in the hospital from burns. Hadeen went into hiding after the spree. The local police department had already determined that he was the perpetrator of the crimes and had launched a manhunt. They discovered Hadeen's automobile parked in front of a lakeside cabin, complete with a suicide note on the front seat. Hadeen said in the note that he was only adept at following other criminals and that he killed his parents so that they would not have to endure the consequences of his misdeeds. His body was later discovered in the lake, weighted down. John Christie. Serial killer John Christie should have never been a cop to begin with. He had a criminal record that included theft and violent assault, and he'd spent time in prison. But all of this was overlooked, and he was able to join the War Reserve Police, where his service was deemed highly efficient and credible. While serving as a policeman, however, he committed his first of many murders. Christie had an affair with Ruth First, a 21-year-old prostitute. He strangled her to death one night while having sex with her, and then buried her in the communal garden of his Rillington Place apartment. This fueled his urge to murder other women, and he chose Muriel Eady, a neighbor. Christie called her over on the guise of being a doctor who might treat her with her chest problem. He rendered her unconscious with a carbon monoxide inhaler, then strangled and raped her before burying her body near first in the garden. Beryl Evans, another of his neighbors, would become his third victim. Beryl and her husband, Timothy, sought to abort Beryl's pregnancy, thinking they would be unable to sustain another child. Christie attempted to assist, claiming to be a doctor once more. Instead, he raped and strangled Beryl with a necktie before burying her body in the property's garden shed. Christie told Timothy Evans that his wife had died of septic shock and that he would find a good home for their one-year-old child. The baby was eventually discovered in the garden shed with Beryl's remains. Evans confessed to killing his wife and child out of sadness and a desire to protect Christie. He was eventually hung for the crimes. Christie would kill three more prostitutes and his wife, Ethel, in the years to come. He hid their bodies in different parts of the house. After Christie abruptly moved out, a new tenant discovered the three prostitutes stashed in a papered-over recess in the kitchen. When the cops arrived to investigate, Ethel's body would be located beneath the floorboards. Christie was soon found in London and tried for his crimes. He originally entered an insanity plea, but with less than two hours of reflection, the jury ruled against him, sentencing him to hang for the murder of his wife. Christie was executed two weeks later on July 15, 1953. Mikhail Popkov. 
Mikhail Popkov would use his uniform and patrol car to gain his victims' trust before luring them to their deaths. From 1992 to 2000, Popkov targeted full figured women who resembled his abusive mother, attacking them with a screwdriver, axe, or knife. He would then rape his victims before leaving their mutilated bodies in forests throughout the town of Angersk, Russia. Popkov murdered at least 22 women, but the exact number could be well over 30. The severity of the murders would haunt the community and make national headlines, earning Popkov the moniker, the werewolf, for his attack's brutality. However, the assassination ceased after that. Popkov claimed he got a venereal condition that went untreated, rendering him impotent and preventing him from taking pleasure in his killings and rapes. Popkov managed to elude detectives for two decades, even after one of his potential victims escaped and positively identified Popkov as her attacker. However, a mandatory DNA test was administered in 2012 for all law enforcement officials in Angersk, thus identifying Popkov as the notorious werewolf. In January 2015, Popkov was sentenced to life imprisonment. Christopher Jordan Derner The catalyst to Christopher Derner's reign of horror began when he was released from the police force. He was let go after filing a report accusing another officer of extreme and unnecessary force during an arrest. He felt his release was unjustified, and in 2013 he set out to seek revenge on those he felt wronged him. Monica Kwan and Keith Lawrence were the first two people killed by Derner. While in their automobile, they were photographed up close. Both had never seen Derner before, but Kwan's father was an LAPD captain at the time Derner was fired. In his manifesto, Derner stated that he went after Kwan's daughter and her fiancé because he didn't think Kwan did a good enough job defending him. Derner posted his crazed manifesto to his Facebook page, detailing his grievances and listing those who would pay for them. This was just the beginning of nearly two weeks of eccentric antics and random killings that would leave four people dead and another two injured. The LAPD revisited the case of Derner's release after the manifesto was posted, and Chief Charlie Beck went to the media to reassure Derner that his demands for a review of his firing were serious. Meanwhile, authorities launched a manhunt for Derner and offered a reward, considering him to be a domestic terrorist and a menace to society. During this time, he ambushed and killed Officer Michael Crane while on regular patrol, injuring his colleague. On February 12, 10 days after Derner's crazed killing spree started, it all ended in a mountain cabin standoff with the police. Deputy Jeremiah McKay was killed during a gunfight as Derner stood his ground, opening fire as officers tried to smoke him out with tear gas. At one point, they heard a single gunshot from inside the cabin. The tear gas unintentionally set fire to the cabin and caused the ammunition inside to explode, making it dangerous for police to enter. The cabin's charred remains were removed, and dental records verified that they were those of Christopher Derner. A self-inflicted gunshot to the head was confirmed to be the official cause of death. <laughs> Chiagu Henrique Gomes da Rocha Security guards aren't police officers, yet they are persons in positions of control. We entrust them with our lives and well-being, so it can be alarming when one of them breaks the law. Take, for example, Thiago Henrique Gomes da Rocha. Da Rocha, a Brazilian security guard, would go down in history as one of the world's most prolific serial murders. Da Rocha killed at least 39 people before being apprehended in 2014. He claimed he murdered to relieve his emotional agony and suffering after being sexually assaulted as a child. Targeting homeless people, homosexuals, and prostitutes who looked like his long-term girlfriend, Da Rocha would approach people on his motorcycle before yelling, robbery. He would then shoot his victims with 38 revolver and drive away from the scene. For some reason, however, he never once stole anything from them. Da Rocha was eventually hauled up by police for having phony plates on his motorcycle. As a result, he was apprehended. The residence where he lived with his mother was searched, and the handgun used in the murders was located there. While in arrest, Da Rocha eventually delivered a complete confession to authorities, and he is now awaiting his trial. <laughs> Zheng Kaigui Withdrawing enormous sums of money from banks is fairly usual in China, as cash is by far the most widely accepted form of payment. Zheng Kaigui, a serial murderer, 
targeted his victims as they departed with cash, shooting them and fleeing with their cash. Zheng Kaigui served as a police officer in the People's Liberation Army and was an expert in surveillance. This training allowed him to be a recluse who kept to himself and rarely interacted with anyone. And when he did, he usually communicated with just body language and grunts. It also helped him elude police officers when they first became aware of his robbing and killing in 2004. However, in 2012, he was identified outside a Nanjing bank after shooting a man and making off with about $30,000. Believing he was responsible for six other deaths and two injuries in similar crimes, authorities sent 13,000 police officers and two helicopters after Kaigui. However, he was never found, and it's possible he could commit another robbery in the future. David Stephen Middleton Former Miami cop David Stephen Middleton used his new profession as a cable installer to find his victims. However, he never used his police knowledge to keep from being captured. Catherine Elizabeth Powell's body was discovered bound in waste bags and rope in a Reno, Nevada, trash container in February 1995. Because he performed a service call to Powell's house days before she was murdered, Middleton was a strong suspect. Even more damaging, he bought stereo equipment with her credit card and then had his roommate pick it up for him. Powell's body was also covered in a specific yellow trash bag by the perpetrator. Only two retailers in Middleton's region offered these bags. The garbage bags, stereo, and numerous other incriminating items were located in a storage facility that Middleton rented after the search warrant was issued. The bones of Thelma de Villa last seen in 1994 were discovered in a similar manner to Powell's in September of the same year, implying that Middleton killed de Villa before killing Catherine. Middleton's storage locker had a blanket belonging to de Villa, as well as a hair that was positively recognized as de Villa's. Also, on the final night de Villa was seen, a bus driver who knew her dropped her off, and he saw her get into a truck with a man who matched Middleton's description. Middleton was detained as the evidence against him grew stronger. He was charged with two counts of kidnapping and grand larceny, as well as two counts of murder, after a trial in 1996. Middleton was convicted and given the death penalty. Another body was discovered in an alleged body dump while he was in prison. Middleton is one of the suspects in the case, and FBI agents are seeking public assistance in identifying her. Anthony Jack Sully Anthony Jack Sully departed the Milbray City Police Department after eight years of service and began his own contracting firm. Sully began freebasing cocaine and employing escorts, preferring the girls who worked for Tina Livingston, as his business grew swiftly. Sully perpetrated the first of six horrible murders in February 1983. He had Livingston bring Gloria Fravel to his company warehouse, where he gagged and shackled her when she refused Sully's advances. With the help of Livingston and another prostitute, he then hanged her from the ceiling and raped her repeatedly over the weekend. Fravel's gag eventually came undone, and she cried for aid. Sully then tightened the noose around her neck, dangling her until her body went slack. They carried her in the car, thinking she was dead, to dispose of the body, but when they unloaded her, they discovered she was still alive. Sully then repeatedly struck her with a hatchet till she died. Sully retained the newspaper item reporting the investigation because he thought it was amusing that Fravel was discovered by a butcher. Two months later, Sully killed another of Livingston's prostitutes, 19-year-old Brendan Oakton, in a very similar fashion. Only this time, he stored her body in a barrel before disposing of it. A month later, he murdered another prostitute and her pimp, Phyllis Melendez and Michael Thomas, respectively. Once again, he stored their bodies in barrels. A fourth prostitute named Barbara Searcy was his next casualty, and his final known victim was Catherine Barrett, bringing his total to six. Sully was arrested in August 1983, despite the fact that he had a mountain of evidence against him. Not only were goods used to dispose of the dead discovered in his vehicle and warehouse, but his footprint was also captured on the plastic sheeting that covered Cersei and Barrett. His fingerprints were also discovered on the barrels that were used to contain Oakden, Melendez, and Thomas. In addition to several testimonials from prostitutes who claimed to have been assaulted by Scully, Livingston testified against him as part of a plea deal. After a seven-week trial, Sully was convicted and given the death penalty in June 1986. 
His appeal of both the convictions and the death penalty was denied in 2013, leaving him few options for an overturn. Gennady Makashevich Gennady Makashevich was a volunteer police officer, or Druzhinik, for the Voluntary People's Druzhina in the USSR. He was often assigned to work the cases of his own murders, conducting interviews and handling evidence. From 1971 to 1985, Makashevich killed a confirmed 36 women, but the total could actually be nearer 55. He often raped and strangled his victims, but he let other men take the fall for his crimes. Tragically, 13 people were convicted in his place, 12 of whom were sent to labor camps. And one unfortunate soul was shot. After being forced into confessing by torture and threats. However, investigators later realized that the killings must have been committed by one person as they were all similar in execution. Makashevich began to be concerned that he might be apprehended because of the serial murderer notion. So he wrote an anonymous letter to the police, signed, Patriot of Vitebisk, claiming that the deaths were the result of the time's corruption. After another message was left next to a new victim, authorities decided to match the letter to the handwriting of over 500,000 males in the city of Oblast, which offered them a lead. They discovered Mikashevich's DNA sample and used it in conjunction with other evidence to get to the conclusion that he was the serial killer. Mikashevich's fate is unknown, despite the fact that he confessed and was detained. According to some stories, he committed suicide while incarcerated. Others claim he was shot by a firing squad. But one thing is certain. His arrest exposed the ineptness and corruption of the Soviet police force at the time. He was also the first serial killer to be identified by the Soviet state-run media. Norbert Polk One could say Norbert Polky's string of murders began as a crime of passion. A veteran police officer, Polky's daughter passed away from cancer in March 1984, leaving the family with around $400,000 in debt. But while he wanted to provide for his loved ones, things quickly spiraled out of control. From May 1984 to October 1985, police noticed a pattern in bank robberies occurring in West Germany. The assailant would break the teller window with a sledgehammer. After demanding money, he would then escape in a stolen vehicle. The owner of the getaway vehicle would then be found dead, shot in the head, in an area near the bank. This occurred at least three times, and police were now on the lookout for a serial attacker. Police identified the gun used in the last robbery, which was unsuccessful, as a Walther P5 pistol, which is regularly provided to cops. The police uniform of Norbert Polk was then discovered in a storage at the Ludwigsburg train station by investigators. Polky's recent unusual conduct, his daughter's death, and his big debts prompted authorities to pay him a visit and ask him some questions. They were, however, too late. Polk took sick leave, went home, and shot his wife and one of his sons, fearing the cops were on to him. Polk and his second child then vanished, but their bodies were discovered in northern Italy by authorities. In what appeared to be a murder-suicide, both were shot in the head with the Walther P5. Ballistics would also show that Polk was involved in all three robberies and shootings, effectively closing the case. Subscribe to the channel and like it, there are still many interesting stories ahead.